South Bronx, the borough that gave birth to hip hop. There's a militarized police department that is ready to attack the people. Some people have taken the streets, they've shut down the highway. There's an understanding that when the planet wins, the people win too. Don't stop. Amor, justicia, hip hop, revoluciones. Save our schools, SOS! Save our schools, SOS! Save our schools, SOS! Since their historic strike in 2012, the Chicago Teachers Union has been rallying teachers, parents, and community in defense of public education at a time when charter schools, standardized tests, and privatization are being imposed. Yet this year's negotiations are taking on an added sense of urgency in the context of a budget crisis in the state of Illinois that has public universities closing, elementary schools cutting key personnel, and general uncertainty as people face the prospect of layoffs and furloughs. We went to Chicago this past week to find out how this fiscal crisis is specifically affecting families and the measures they're taking to make ends meet while still demanding justice and a fair resolution to the state budget standoff. We spoke with Celia Chavez, a working mother who's facing monumental challenges as a result of these cutbacks. Right now we're experiencing a very unique opportunity window is what I like to consider it, where public education across the entire pipeline is under attack. And so you have the CTU who is defending public education from K through 12. Um, and then you have the universities, the public universities that are defending public education at the college university level in higher education. I think that people coming together from the entire educational spectrum and also from community organizations um, that have also been very vocal grassroots organizations that understand that if we don't fund public education, it creates a whole array of other social issues. In the city of Chicago, we're seeing you know, that there's an increase in violence, for example. But if you have these same communities that are starved of resources, particularly in education, you're going to see an increase in violence and, and you know, other issues. Um, so I'm hoping that there is strength in numbers, right? History has taught us that there is strength in numbers. And so, like I said before, this is a unique opportunity window where it's bringing so many people together. And there's this common denominator that, you know, is affecting all of us. And so increased funding for education, you know, uh, maybe less funding for jails, less funding for Chicago Police Department. Already the city of Chicago, 40% of their budget goes to the police department. And I don't believe that that even includes the settlements that are being paid out to the victims of police brutality. And so if we shift some of that funding from those areas to education, it's a benefit for society in general. Well, I accepted a position in August at Northeastern Illinois University as the Assistant Director for Proyecto Palante, which is an academic support program for Latino students. Uh, from currently, I am on furlough status at the university that I work at. One day a week, my position is considered administrative and professional, so we are non-unionized, so we were the first targets for the furloughs. Um, we're having to, it's mandatory that we take one furlough day a week. So for me personally, that's at least over $700 less a month. And as a family that depends on one income, that makes a big difference. That's practically my rent. And so uh, that's why you see me here working part-time selling tamales to compensate, try to comp you know, compensate for some of that loss, the financial loss. My life goal is to create two strong critical thinkers, two strong women that are critical thinkers. I want them to know the things that I didn't know at their age and that it took me years to learn. Um, I want them to understand what their teachers are going through every day. I want them to understand how government, how politics, how policy, how all of those things impact us in so many areas of our life. It's important for me that they know how to stand up for what is right. 
And so that is what I seek to teach them, you know, by participating in the different marches and exposing them to that reality. It's important that they understand that at an early age because if we want to create leaders, if we want to create social change, transformational social change, it really starts at, at ground zero. Community has always been a haven. Um, no matter what is going on outside of the community, then, you know, I always feel comfortable knowing that, for example, when I came in here to order a tamal and I walked out having a job because the owner seen that I was a mom of two little girls, that I was asking for, you know, work part time, and she could relate to that. She herself had a very similar experience as a single mom. And actually, a lot of the women that she employs here are women that are have had issues of homelessness, women that are single moms, women that have left abusive relationships. And so, again, because of her personal experience, she really tries to you know, reach out to the community and provide that opportunity for women to be empowered. Um, my daughter has shared with me that there's a lack of resources in terms of you know, technology and, and equipment that they need to, you know, um, to make their learning easier. And so I know that there's been cuts to that uh, in terms of counselors and social workers. Again, going back to the idea that if there's a lack of funding in education, you're going to see an increase in social issues elsewhere, right? And so if we're not providing students with adequate resources in terms of counseling, in terms of social workers, then it just creates more of an issue in the school but also in our communities. There was also, I was reading in the paper, um, an opportunity for, for school districts within the state. It was actually a federal, um, federal funding opportunity where school districts could have access to $500 million in interest-free loans to repair schools, to develop schools, to build, you know, whether it was, you know, ex um, expand schools because of overcrowding or because of just, you know, dilapidated, you know, buildings. Um, and the state of Illinois sat on that for six years. For six years, that opportunity sat on the shelf. And so when we're told that there is no funding for education, we have to question that. If that financial opportunity was there, we would not be in the situation that we are in now. And so I feel like that is, you know, we can place direct blame on Mayor Rahm Emanuel because I'm sure he knew that opportunity was available. We can place blame on the governors of the state of Illinois because it sat for six years. So obviously it's not just Bruce Rahner that, you know, um, that is to blame. It's his predecessor as well that didn't release those funds, didn't promote that opportunity to the school districts. And so is this a manufactured crisis? It's what it makes me think as a critical thinker. This is manufactured. If there's access to resources, but those that are elected officials and are supposed to be looking out for the best interests of the people are not sharing that information, not putting those opportunities out there for school districts to access, then what is it really? Your actions don't support what you are saying then. You know, what is really the intent? To let the public system uh, fail so that we can implement a private charter type of school system? Is this gonna be another New Orleans? I mean, I don't know, I don't know, but th that's definitely what the, what the actions, what the decision making, that's what it would indicate.